Um, so the plan for today is uh, as follows. After a uh, welcome by uh, our director, the director of the Center for Religious Studies, Marco Ventura, and from the director of the ICT Center of FPK, Paolo Traverso, I will give a general introduction to the webinar series. I will talk for about 15, 20 minutes. Um, after that, we will have our first talk in the series, Jakob Chaudhary's uh, talk, uh, interacting with and within the artificial, um, about 25 minutes, and then we will have another 25 minutes for, of Q&A time. Um, so, um, enough for this short introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Marco Ventura, who's actually here in the office with me now. Um, thank you very much for being here with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will, I will use uh, your, your camera as a, as a small sign of the fact that uh, uh, we, we are at distance, but <laughs> we also at the same time within uh, the same uh, building and center and institution here. Um, so a uh, warm welcome um, from my side as well. Uh, and many thanks to Boris Treme, who's been uh, the engine and the pillar. And you, well, you, you, you name the all possible metaphors to indicate um, his fantastic uh, job. Uh, now, um, the only important point I need to make is uh, twofold. First, thank you, everybody, for being with us uh, today. I saw the list of those who registered for the webinar. It, it really looks an, an amazing uh, uh, spa of uh, 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 backgrounds and, and origins and, and, and people and backgrounds. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, uh, trust on the event. And we uh, count very much on your contribution active contribution as much as possible uh, today and for the rest of the series. And the second uh, aspect is for us at Fondazione Bruno Kessler, the, this is not just one event. This is not one just, just one isolated event. This uh, meeting with you today and hopefully for the rest of the series is our everyday life. It's been built uh, in preparation of this event as uh, a uh, landing point of our everyday life of research, of action, of interaction within our center and uh, within FBK as a whole. It is planned to be, it is meant to be, we want this to be in its continuation, a uh, continuing interaction, an ongoing unfolding interaction between uh, our everyday life in research and you and your, your institutions, your centers, wherever you are and whatever um, you do. And whatever uh, is pushing you, as is pushing us to be interested in this fantastic topic. This is, of course, an intellectual exercise which is also uh, deep in meanings in terms of social responsibility. Uh, before starting this seminar, uh, we were, um, we, we've been busy for some months on a webinar series on COVID-19 and religion, raising awareness and discussing about the impact of the religion and the impact on religion of the crisis, this dimension of social global responsibility in its manifold dimensions is very important as we start this series. Let's work together to combine at the best of our ability, our intellectual effort and our action and our responsibility when we experience religion or no religion and when we, uh, and as well as uh, uh, or when we study uh, religion. Thank you so much, and the floor back to Boris Rene. Thank you Thank very you much, very Professor much. Ventura. Um, uh, please let me remind you again to switch off your microphones, please, otherwise we have these feedback loops. Thank you very much. Um, 
So um, I give the floor to Paolo, Paolo Traverso, the director of the Center for Information and Communication Technologies here at FBK. I do hope that you can hear me uh, well now. Um, uh, if not so, please let me know and I'll try and uh, fix the problem. We can hear you, okay. Boris. So, Paolo, <laughs> great, great to have you here. Uh, and you, the floor is yours, Paolo. Thank you, Boris. Uh, thank you very much for organizing uh, this uh, event. And uh, a warm welcome also from my side to all the speakers and to all the attendees. As uh, many of you know, my area of research is artificial intelligence, but I firmly believe that uh, our studies, our research uh, cannot be a standalone. It's not only a technical matter. We need to work together with people that are expert in sociological issues, anthropological, religious, legal issues. We really need to work together because uh, artificial intelligence can be a very powerful technology, can be really used to go do good things or very bad things. So I believe that we should really work together. Let me conclude with two brief remarks. I have a, a special thank to Professor Marco Ventura. As some of you know, the Center for ICT and even more the Center for Religious Studies, they are here in FBK since a huge amount of years, something like more than 30 years, even more. But this is the first time that, and really thanks to Professor Ventura, that we are collaborating together because uh, Marco has uh, introduced a new model of working for the Center of Religious Study. And I believe this was a very good approach that allowed us to work together. And this is very important, I believe, uh, for our research, and I hope also for the research in religious studies. The second point, I have to thank Boris and Oliviero Stock. You know, Oliviero, is the father of artificial intelligence, FBK. And uh, we all, people working on artificial intelligence, owe so much to Oliviero. I'm very happy that Oliviero and Boris uh, really work together to gather this very interesting uh, set of very interesting speakers uh, and organize this event. So I'm very happy we have this occasion. I really give you all a warm welcome and thank you very much and have a really wonderful day together. Thank you very much, Boris. It's back to you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you very much, Professor Ventura, for your uh, welcome remarks. Um, I will now give a, um, a general introduction, a very preliminary introduction, really. Um, so please, uh, if you do not want to be recorded, um, uh, switch off your cameras and uh, mute your microphones. Um, okay, so here we go. Artificial intelligence and religion. Let me get this uh, presentation going here. Um, hold on. Entire screen. Should be screen one. Screen one. Allow. Can you see this now? The yes, very good. But is it, can you see? Can you see the? Uh, do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Well, Great. we see we see your computer. You you du hast noch nicht den Präsentationsmodus gestartet. Uh, hold on. Uh, Right, so jetzt. Can you see this now? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, artificial intelligence and religion. Um, uh, at first glance, the the uh, uh, the concatenation of these terms, artificial intelligence and religion, might seem to be rather unlikely and surprising, really, um, uh, what do these things have to do with each other? And uh, the question also is, of course, what are we talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence and religion? Another question is, why should religion researchers and AI researchers take an interest uh, in the intersections or the entanglements of AI and religion 
in the first place. Now, in a sense, um, this is um, all these questions are part of the uh, complex of issues that will be debated and discussed during our webinar series, maybe also negotiated. Um, uh, it is well known that different researchers use the terms religion and um, artificial intelligence to refer to very different things. Um, and there are even those who, who argue that we should refrain from using these terms altogether for various reasons. Mm. So in my presentation, I will uh, start um, with contextualizing a little bit more the Air 2020-21 webinar series in our work on religion and innovation. In the second uh, section, I will uh, say a little bit, I do, and get, we'll engage in some kind of uh, yeah, preliminary conceptual stage setting uh, regarding AI and religion. Um, this is just my take on the matter, and it goes without saying that you are all welcome to dismantle that conceptual stage and set up a better one in, um, in what follows. Um, and I will close with a, a look at some of the research lines, topics um, that will play a role during our webinar series. So let me remind you of the uh, Air 2020-21 website where you can find the complete program, almost complete, uh, speaker bios, abstracts, and so on. Uh, that's uh, air2020.fpk.eu. So the, the first... Uh, That's, I can't do anything about this. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the, the webinar series in the context of our work on um, religion and innovation. Paolo has already um, said a few things about the uh, collaboration between our center and the Center for Information and Communication Technology here at FPK, which is really much bigger than our center. They have, if I'm, not, if I'm correct, about 350 researchers there now. And there is an overall strategic commitment of the foundation to um, uh, researching and developing human-centered artificial intelligence technologies. Um, so this is somehow the context from which our interest uh, arises in the, in the institutional context. Um, I should also mention our 2019 position paper, Religion and Innovation, Calibrating Research Approaches and Suggesting Strategies for a Fruitful Interaction. Um, as I see it, one of the main um, points of that paper was to uh, argue that in order to understand technology, you have to understand uh, technology as contextualized, interpreted, and perceived in social contexts. And this is why, uh, in order to understand uh, innovations in technology, uh, you will also have to understand um, interpretations, perceptions, and the ways in which people engage with those technologies. Um, I should also mention our uh, 2000, yeah, recently published response paper to the European Commission's public consultation on the uh, white paper, Artificial Intelligence, a European Approach to Excellence and Trust. And um, currently, you can find this on our website. Currently, my colleague Margarita Galassini is working on, an, on a report that will analyze uh, contributions of faith-based actors and um, uh, faith-based uh, institutions to that consultation of the European Commission. Good, so artificial intelligence. Well, the, the, the term, the, the expression artificial intelligence um, refers to a range of different but interrelated, obviously, and intersecting technologies, including such things as automated reasoning, machine learning, natural language processing, machine perception, and uh, in the case of robotics, um, motion manipulation uh, of physical objects. Um, the, the important thing to, to keep in mind is that uh, the term or the, the expression artificial intelligence is not a proper name of some single thing in the world. It is rather a, um, an umbrella term that uh, is used to refer to many different things that have to do with each other, but which are also in constant uh, flux, really, in constant development and um, Sometimes uh, one has the impression that what counts as AI today, um, a couple of uh, years from now, will not count as AI anymore because things have moved on um, uh, in different directions or at a fast pace. 
So here's a broad but uh, I think still useful account, uh, which comes from Nielsen. Nielsen writes, artificial intelligence, I quote, is that activity devoted to making machines intelligent, and intelligence is that quality that enables an entity to function appropriately and with foresight in its environment, unquote. Now, this is very broad, but it gives some idea of what we are talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence. Now, when people do talk about artificial intelligence, in particular when we have to do with um, non-expert uh, um, non conversations, it's not quite sure often what people are really referring to. So here are um, a few further distinctions which could be useful um, to keep in mind. The idea of strong artificial intelligence. Let me start with the, with the extreme. Um, uh, those would be AI systems that would have a mind, including self-awareness and a sense of identity, and maybe the capacity to set their own goals. Then we have the idea of general AI, which would be AI systems with cross-domain capabilities. Uh, think of a system that cannot just play chess, but also drive a car, write poetry, and uh, maybe do many other things. The idea here is, of course, the more things that system would be able to do, the more general it would be. So I will... Uh, um, um, in a minute, come back to, to an even more, um, more uh, to an even stronger idea, which somehow combines strong AI and general AI into the uh, uh, idea of what has what is now known as the singularity. But let's look at weak AI first. Weak AI, as opposed to strong AI, would be systems or are systems that do not have self-consciousness. So these things actually exist. Weak AI does exist, narrow AI systems do exist. Strong AI and general AI, um, well, general AI, I'm not quite sure that it does not exist at some very initial level uh, at the moment, but uh, at least um, what is fair to say is that most AI research and development today concentrates on narrow and weak AI systems. In, for instance, automated driving, machine translation, stock trading, medical image analysis, uh, and what uh, is being called smart weapons. It is also fair to say that much of the work that has come from religion scholars who are interested in the intersections or entanglements uh, between AI and religion um, has concerned not so much the impact of strong AI and general AI on present day forms of religiosity uh, because these things, well, they do not exist so they cannot really have an impact on anything. Uh, at the moment, um, but on the impact of imageries, ideas, uh, interpretations of these things on contemporary forms of religiosity. So I will uh, maybe come back to this um, in a minute. Um, so this uh, speculative uh, uh, AI, um, the idea of uh, a, a strongly, um, of a strong and um, completely general uh, artificial intelligence system, the idea of a singularity, this idea has been um, endorsed by some figures who are very, very influential uh, media-wise, uh, but it has also made its way into, into, um, into social science research concerning uh, religion and artificial intelligence. So let me give you a quote which is actually quite well known, but it might give some, some substance to this idea of a um, singularity from uh, Irving Good from 1965. I quote, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine, and here comes the loop, could design even better machines. So there would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. Uh, I skip the rest. the rest. Now, this is definitely an intriguing thought. The question is whether this is more than an intriguing thought. As my background is in philosophy, I'm deal with thought experiments, and one, one check on thought experiments is whether or not they contain logical contradictions. So um, that's like a necessary condition for something being a worthwhile 
uh, thought experiments that did not contain any logical contradictions. Um, but that doesn't mean very much. I mean, the, the thing is that this thought expressed by good, as far as I'm concerned, does not taste of logical contradictoriness at all. There's no logical contradiction in there. So logically speaking, uh, what he envisages here is a possible scenario. But logical possibility, of course, is not what, um, uh, what we expect when we really and seriously take into consideration future scenarios in technology. Um, I mean, there are many, many logically consistent uh, situations that I can imagine and that I can describe, uh, but still no one would take them seriously as um, real possibilities. Yeah. Okay, so um, here's a quote from Luciano Floridi. I really like, like that text of Floridi's from by two, 2015. Um, so where Floridi says, we should be worried about real human stupidity, not imaginary artificial intelligence. When, when Floridi uses this expression, imaginary artificial intelligence, what he refers to is this extreme form of combination of the red parts of my little picture. Yeah? So strong and completely general AI, um, uh, uh, yeah, but, but in, 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 an, in, in an extreme form, let's say. Now, um, as Floridi points out, these speculative, speculative tendencies and the focus on um, imageries uh, of imaginary AI uh, can tend to distract from very concrete issues uh, that arise from the employment of narrow and weak AI systems today. So um, some examples would be um, racial and uh, ideological and gender bias, the black box or transparency or opacity problem that automated decision-making systems often work in ways that are not just not comprehensible to the individuals that are affected by those decisions, but um, that um, are not completely comprehensible, at least after some time, even to those people who programmed these things in the first place. Then there's the problem, there are problems of fairness, accountability, and security, and so on. So what does all this have to do with religion? Um, let's, let me talk a little bit about religion now, and I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. Um, there, again, there is no agreed upon definition, of course, um, but the more I think about AI and religion, uh, the more I'm convinced that we really have an interesting, um, even if somewhat dated, uh, distinction that we can work with for, as, a, as a first, first approach to, the, to, the, um, to what uh, to expect from religion and, and uh, artificial intelligence research. The distinction between functional and substantive accounts. Um, well, functional accounts define religion in the light of the purposes it serves or the needs it meets. That is, in terms of the functions it, um, of religious thought and practice in the lives of individuals and societies. The main criticism that is leveled against these kinds of accounts is usually that functional accounts include too much. They include too many things. Um, in the extension of the term religion. So as opposed to functional accounts, we then have substantive accounts, uh, which define religion by reference to the assumption on the part of religious believers or practitioners of the existence of some supernatural entity or process uh, which is relevant to human existence. Now, the main criticism leveled against these, this kind of, of, uh, of approach is that this definition excludes too much. So um, what we should expect, really, and I think this is pretty much what we see in much uh, recent uh, work on religion and innovation, is the following. Um, advocates of functional accounts of religion um, uh, will find more interactions as compared to advocates of substantive accounts of religion between AI and religion. And the reason is simple. Uh, that will be just because they will count more aspects of human thought and practice as instances of religion. Um, as opposed to that, uh, advocates of substantive accounts of religion will find less interactions simply because they will count less aspects of human thought and practice as instances of religion. Uh, very roughly, anything that doesn't involve reference to supernatural entities or processes is out. Yeah? Um, now, I'm not going to try to go any deeper into this. I just want to uh, make a, one remark 
regarding the relevance of this for our um, webinar series and for research on AI and religion. I think that um, research on AI and religion is an excellent context also for critical reflection and thought about our conceptions and accounts of religion. So in a sense, um, this is a very good test bed for, um, for different, different approaches to, 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 uh, to religion, different research methodologies and so on and so forth. Good, um, some of the research lines um, and topics that will play a role, uh, well, involvement of religious actors uh, in public debates over AI governance. I already talked about this a little bit with regard to the, um, to the uh, EC, uh, European Commission's um, consultation on the white paper. We have the problem of value alignment, religiously, uh, religiously grounded values, and the question of whether and if so, how they um, should play a role in debates over AI governance and maybe even in the definition of utility functions for, for um, advanced artificial intelligence systems. Um, we have the, the topic of artificial intelligence and freedom of religion or belief. Um, AI technologies promoting or impeding freedom of religion or belief. At the moment, I guess we have uh, clear examples of um, artificial intelligence technologies being used to impede and to oppress um, uh, freedom of religious, religion or belief. Uh, we have not many clear examples of technologies, AI technologies that are used to promote freedom of religion or belief. Um, the next topic is religious imageries, imagery in AI narratives from sci-fi to research policy documents. This is quite, there exists quite a bit of research uh, um, on this topic already, and the same holds for uh, the role of AI topoi in speculative scenari uh, scenarios of humanity's futures, its connections with such things as transhumanism, singularitarianism, and so on. Um, one thing that has not um, uh, attracted much attention yet, but we will have uh, at least one session on this uh, in, uh, in this webinar series, is AI as a research tool in studying religion. So what is the potential of using AI technology to study religion? And um, of course, here's an, uh, the uh, one topic in this list, another to uh, the last topic in this list, even though this list is by no means exhaustive, um, the use of AI involving technologies in religious practices, for instance, robot priests, and its impact on doing religion today and on contemporary forms of religiosity or spirituality. So um, here's the website again. I'm going to stop here and give the floor to our first speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased that you are here with us, uh, Jakub. Jakub Chaudhry is uh, going to speak about interacting with and within the artificial. Um, after that talk, we will have about 25 minutes time for um, discussion. So the floor is yours, Jakub. Thank you very much again for being here. Um, let me mute my microphone. Yes, good, e good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, uh, or more succinctly, uh, hello world. Uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. Hello world, of course, uh, that phrase that programmers are most familiar with as they conjure up entities and even worlds from the so-called command line uh, of their computer terminals. Uh, the command line, of course, and this whole idea of conjuring up entities and worlds, evoking theological connotations uh, immediately uh, in the production of uh, artificial intelligence and other types of uh, software. Uh, in the Quranic and Islamic contexts, uh, such a uh, creative act is embodied in the divine speech act of God, uh, kun fayakun, uh, be and it is. Uh, so I would say that theological connotations go right through uh, the very heart of uh, the development of these technologies and digital technologies, as we'll discuss in this talk. Um, so to begin with, uh, first I'd like to uh, explain what exactly do I mean 
by with and within the artificial. So anyone who has used cooking utensils or lived in a dwelling has already interacted with and within the artificial. So the title runs the risk of appearing to be dangerously devoid of useful content. What I mean is the artificial recreation of the world through digital technology, including the entities that artificial intelligence is and other types of entities that populate these presently fragmented micro worlds. Hence, what I wish to draw attention to in this talk is that interacting with AI entails interacting within its world. So to refer to uh, Hans Jonas, Hans Jonas talks about the most salient characteristic of technology uh, being its artificial character. And he describes the progress of technology uh, in terms of its increasing artificiality. And he identifies several stages in the development of technology. First, uh, the production of familiar objects that meet human needs, uh, where art imitates nature. Uh, then uh, mechanical technologies where uh, natural, ma uh, mat natural materials and forces are used to produce artifacts and technology. Then uh, the, chemist, the stage of chemistry where the substances of nature are altered uh, and uh, synthetic substance substitutes may be produced. Then going on to the molecular stage of technology uh, where the very patterns of nature are redesigned. Uh, in this case, according to Jonas, artificiality enters the very heart of the matter. But it's electronics uh, that is furthest removed from nature and is a purely artificial creation, according to Jonas, since both its objects and the ends it serves are artificial. So it may seem as though artificial entities are coming to interact in the real world as the range of our interactions with artificial agents and machine forms of intelligence increases. I would just like to check that everyone can see my slides uh, because I am seeing Boris is on my screen. I do see your slides, Jakub. Great, then I'll continue. So what I wish to highlight is that there is a radical disjuncture between the digital and the physical world. And it's the former that subsumes the latter. So rather than thinking that AI is coming into our world to interact with us, what I argue is that we should instead see that it is ourselves and nature that are pared down and hollowed out to be inserted into its artificial world. It is not a mutual symbiosis of two worlds. It is the displacement of the real and true uh, our world for the artificial and illusory. So our experience today is illustrative of how the digital world has exceeded a boundary unprecedented in the history in history that has totally configured reconfigured the environment and lived experience of people. However, the problem goes further in that people and society are placed in a position of viewing the natural world and life itself through the veil of artificiality. So to, to discuss the artificial firmament, which increasingly represents the primary plane for our actions and interactions, is not a change of subject away from AI but I argue is an essential aspect of the discussion on AI. So it's worth noting that preceding the resurgence of AI uh, research in the past decade was a wide scale discourse on so-called big data and cloud computing, which entailed uh, discourses of deterritorialization de ter and dematerialization. So for the present purposes, I cite two examples in the recent history of AI, uh, which are worthy of attention to my mind. First is the history of the company NVIDIA and their introduction of G the GPU, GPGPU, GPU, uh, General Purpose Graphics Processing Units. Uh, so this was hardware designed specifically for rendering virtual worlds, the virtual worlds of computer games, uh, which was repurposed to compute operations related to AI, uh, achieving orders of mag magnitude increases in performance, enabling the very type of uh, connectionist uh, paradigm of AI that we see uh, gaining such intense interest. Uh, there's also, I would like to point out to a, an interesting symbolism in the uh, NVIDIA logo, which uh, I won't discuss now, but it could perhaps be a topic for later on. Uh, and I would also say that the recent acquisition of ARM by NVIDIA is very interesting. Uh, in this connection because it, of ARM's role in the, um, for in, in providing chips for uh, 
Internet of Things devices and sensor technology. Um, so anyway, back to NVIDIA. Uh, driving this, uh, some of their work is a certain notion about the way the brain produces um, our intelligence. Uh, there's an analogy being made to uh, computation in the brain producing mental images when we think, but then also that it's just a matter of finding out what those uh, what operations the brain is performing and implementing those three technologies like GPUs or tensor processing processing units or other type of hardware uh, and intelligence can be produced in the same way. Uh, so anyway, the key point here is that the production of virtual worlds of computer games precedes uh, the making of AI. Um, and then is once again implicated uh, in uh, the development of AI itself. So here is a demonstration from NVIDIA. Um, so I'll turn the audio off there. Uh, where the robot is being trained um, in simulation and then it's brought out into the real world. Uh, so this is an example again of uh, virtual worlds being superimposed back again uh, onto the real world. Um, so I'll let that run a bit more. Now, the second example I'd like to refer to in this connection between video games and um, AI is in the history of the company DeepMind. Their AlphaGo system, of course, uh, provided significant impetus to the current resurgence of AI research. Uh, before that, uh, two decades ago, uh, the founders of the company DeepMind were involved in actually making computer games. Uh, and one of their games, Republic the Revolution, uh, is of great interest in, in this connection since they were one of the um, uh, major aspects of the technology running the game world uh, was the so-called totality engine. Um, and within that totality engine was the ability to render scenes down to minute detail, but then also to populate that world with uh, millions of individual living, breathing people uh, down to their daily routines and their beliefs and loyalties. So this was the combination of uh, the, the totality engine, the world, and artificial intelligence. Um, and again, video games come back in to the research of DeepMind uh, where they again use video games to drive uh, research in AI. Uh, video games represent uh, the ideal training ground for uh, artificial agents. Uh, according to Demis Hassabis, founder of uh, DeepMind, uh, they are like microcosms of the real world, but are cleaner and more constrained. So my point here is that interest in virtual worlds and AI in the gaming industry prefigures research in contemporary AI. Uh, and this idea of ludification is very important also in a theological context. Uh, for, for example, in the uh, Quranic narrative, uh, God mentions quite often uh, in various places, uh, as an example, uh, what is the life of this world but play and amusement? Uh, so, uh, So this idea of the um, entering the, the virtual world uh, has its ultimate um, uh, endpoint in the total the total integration of human beings into virtual reality. Uh, so here we see two people. This is a demonstration from Facebook who bought a virtual reality technology company. Um, and what we're seeing here is two people seemingly playing uh, football in a well. On a, on a football field with nets and the ball and everything. But what's revealed here is that actually these two people are not actually in uh, the real world. They're in a completely virtual world. Uh, there's no ball, there's no grass, there's no nets, there's no anything. Uh, yet they act and behave in a way as though they're actually interacting with physical objects. Now the point here is that this represents, I would say, uh, an ultimate trajectory for this, uh, the, the production of virtual worlds. Uh, but Within such worlds, it's not necessary that, he, that the person one is playing with is a human being. This could just as well be an artificial agent uh, on the other side, and one wouldn't, uh, well, if the technology becomes sufficiently, sufficiently um, 
success, successful, uh, then one would not know whether one is interacting with a human or an artificial uh, agent. Uh, so within such world, such worlds, it's an informational representation of us that is taken in to such worlds. It's the avatarization of human presence in virtual reality. Um, and another aspect of this world creation is, which I showed briefly, again, is the recreation of virtual worlds, of historic virtual worlds. Uh, the world of our memories, uh, which uh, Facebook is also interested in, uh, generating uh, the world via point clouds. Um, again, AI is, again, implicated in the possibility of this very technology. The ability to construct uh, this, this virtual environment that we see here from these photographs is, has been enabled by AI and machine vision technology. Um, but it's not that we have to be totally immersed in such virtual reality uh, to be interacting in the world of artificial agents. We're already in that situation. Um, for example, uh, with the uh, ambition towards producing a total digital layer uh, superimposed over physical reality. Uh, so this is the case of Google Sidewalk Labs, um, which, uh, while the project in Toronto was um, was cancelled, uh, the ambition still remains uh, in other places. But part of such a digital layer overlaying physical world is the possibility of simulating uh, a synthetic population. And each of the agents of that synthetic population uh, is a simulation of the informational representation of ourselves in that digital layer. Um, and that those simulations are run by the um, AI models of ourselves. So I'll now briefly talk about um, the theological significance of AI in its own right. Uh, so I'll divide this into two, two sections. Um, first, as a philosophical project, the ambition towards producing artificial general intelligence. Uh, and then the um, the type of AI development which uh, prevails at present, which is the techno-scientific uh, practice in the production of AI artifacts. Uh, so when it comes to the topic of AI and Islam, it's important to note that this topic cannot be understood outside of the historic context of the Western dismantlement of, the, of Aristotelianism and the scholastic worldview. So there's not enough time to elaborate here, but briefly there are certain uh, presuppositions and assumptions about the nature of reality uh, in modernity that underlie the quest for artificial general intelligence. And these need to be interrogated and understood from the perspective of uh, the uh, Islamic metaphysics and the Islamic tradition. First of all, there's the, uh, the presupposition of uh, physicalism, that everything in the universe can be explained uh, by the laws of physics and, uh, and is ultimately um, uh, all that exists. Um, second is the idea of dualism. This particularly comes into uh, uh, the creation of artificial intelligence, uh, it's especially, and it's emphasized more in some streams where the mind is something that the brain creates, i.e. it's software running on a particular form of hardware. Um, then also is the idea of decomposability of brain states, uh, which is the idea that if uh, the the, the the brain states related to consciousness can be decomposed to mechanistic principles um, and then simulated in a different uh, hardware environment. Um, then there's the assumption of behaviorism, and this extends uh, through everything from uh, language as verbal behavior to the behavior of the body, uh, and then going down in temporal and spatial orders of magnitude uh, to the behavior of neural networks in the brain, ensembles of, ne of neurons, and then ultimately the behavior of individual neurons. Uh, everything is cast in a behavioristic perspective. Uh, and finally, a presupposition underlying uh, AI development headed that's uh, that with the ambition of, generate, of producing artificial general intelligence is the idea of multiple realizability, uh, that the type of intelligence that we have uh, is not unique to our physiology. It can be uh, abstracted and uh, emulated or simulated on any other type of uh, hardware or so-called wetware uh, as that as such um, ten 
as such substrates become available. Now, when it comes to the Islamic understanding of intelligence, we need to understand that the potential of the human intellect is not just limited to complex interaction uh, and knowledge of the material world, which is the context in which most definitions of intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence research uh, is being conducted. The ultimate purpose of intelligence and the intellect is to know God. Uh, so God says in the, the uh, in the Quranic discourse, it says, for example, that um, mankind and jinns, another type of entity, another type of being in Islamic ontology, um, have only been created to serve God. Uh, and the interpreters here say that uh, what it means is that to know God through uh, worship. Um, so it's knowledge which is key, um, a certain type of knowledge of reality, which is key uh, in the Islamic understanding of intelligence. So any discussion on the soul must be prefaced by the statement that of the fact that our knowledge of the soul is also fundamentally limited. Uh, so there's a quite an explicit verse in the uh, Quran which says, um, which relates a particular incident where certain uh, tribes were asking the Prophet, peace be upon him, about uh, the spirit or the soul. Um, and the answer God gives in the Quran is that, uh, say the spirit comes by the command of my Lord. Of knowledge, it is only a little that is communicated to you, uh, O mankind. Um, so nevertheless, this didn't stop uh, Islamic theologians and philosophers uh, understanding it as much as possible and developing complex cognitive and psychological theories, uh, in particular to ground Islamic epistemology and the role of reason in understanding uh, revelation. Um, now, some aspects of uh, the Islamic discussion of the soul, uh, which, as far as I know, are unique to the Islamic tradition and worth pointing out here, is that, well, first of all, it's, the soul is the locus of, 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 of the intellect and intelligence. Um, and the soul itself is was created in pre-eternity. Uh, so all souls, human souls, were created. So the idea of... Um, for example, possible self-awareness, insofar as self-awareness requires something like a soul um, in artificial intelligence, uh, then this brings into question what what type of, whether such a thing could is, con is conceivable within the Islamic tradition, uh, since the type of, since the souls of human beings were already created in pre-eternity. Second is the idea of um, uh, the immortality of the soul, of course, which is a key, key theme, that there's the resurrection is both bodily and uh, in soul. Uh, another element which is quite interesting mentioned in the Quran is that uh, the soul uh, is taken by God from the body during sleep. Um, so the particular phase in sleep where the binding between soul and body is, is, is severed or disconnected tem tem temporarily, uh, but it's not it's not death. The body continues living uh, in that phase of sleep. Um, but of course, all of our in intellectual fa faculties are uh, cease to um, come into being. Um, and then this comes into uh, quite a complex discourse on the nature of of dreams. So the phenomenal experience, the locus of the experience and phenomenal um, intellectual intuition, is the soul. So dreams themselves in the Islamic tradition um, occur in the soul as it's left, even as it's left the body. Um, it's not, you know, as discussed in um, neuroscience today, where the um, uh, just uh, an artifact of the brain's activity left over from uh, whatever has been uh, perceived in recent in the recent past. Um, uh, even though that represents one phase of sleep, uh, that's that that the uh, that is discussed. Um, now this takes me to the second area, um, the techno scientific uh, production of artificial intelligence. So, in reality, the long term philosophical project of producing artificial general intelligence has subsided in the face of the tremendous amount of research and development on the techno scientific applications. And the bulk of research and development is directed towards new technical artifacts that embody certain economic, organizational, and ideological principles. So whether that's in a capitalist, socialist, or authoritarian context, 
And addressing the techno-politics of these artifacts is amongst the critical challenges for society. Um, an analysis at this level reveals uh, mechanisms of power in modern society. And again, I'll try and connect this to uh, an Islamic discourse on the nature of, on the archetype of power. So there's a discussion in the, there, there are many narrations related to the Pharaonic power structure uh, in the Quranic discourse, um, which is a very interesting frame of analysis in terms of the hierarchies that are recreated uh, through it, with the technologies that we interact with. Um, and of course, part of that narration in the Quranic narrative is the role of the um, the magician in the Pharaonic um, uh, power structure, uh, where they produce artifacts which ultimately uphold uh, that power structure. Uh, in the same way, uh, AI has this particular, in my, I would argue, AI has this particular valence of having an enchanting power um, of of uh, that that magic had in the modern world. We're discussing the theological significance of the techno scientific side of the um, uh, the development of artificial intelligence technology. Um, so I discuss. So I was discussing the pharaonic uh, archetype of power in the Quranic narrative, uh, but I'll. Um, I won't repeat that uh, in case it wasn't heard, but um, I'm happy to discuss that afterwards. As, but the second element is the idealization of the machine. Uh, so with AI entities and agents, um, we, be, we come into a frame of mind where, where we beseech digital assistance for our needs rather than turning to God. Um, and then also a second element of this is the imputing of intrinsic powers to material objects. Uh, so this is a discussion uh, to, to open up later on. Now, but a more significant aspect, or the most significant aspect of the, that, that I think will have the most significant aspect, in, uh, significant effect into the future, is the, um, in, in the techno-scientific side of production of AI, uh, is the way these artifacts will affect, uh, and this, type, this approach to knowledge will affect science itself. Uh, so science itself becomes increasingly artificial um, and is becoming increasingly artificial as what comes to stand as knowledge uh, and understanding is increasingly mediated through the artificial con constructs of machine models. Uh, the key point is that the objects of analysis have been ab abstracted, severed even from the real world and transformed and delimited by only those attributes that are quantifiable and digitizable. So a further problem occurs when the aforementioned artificial worlds are remapped onto the real world, such that nature is seen through the veil of artificiality. In some sciences, this veil is so opaque that nature is not visible at all. And it is not nature that is subject to observation and analysis, but artificial nature. Um, so AI and machine learning have led to an intensification of the computational turn in research in the digital era, uh, which according to Boyd and Crawford, writing in 2011, reframes key questions about the constitution of knowledge, the processes of research, how we should engage with information and the nature and categorization of reality. Um, now it's new AI techniques and high performance computation, uh, which amount to new digital optics that aid scientists to uncover new insights in the vast quantities of data available. Uh, so this argument has, um, I discussed this argument in one of my papers, Artificialization of Minor World, published in Zygon, and uh, the this uh, recently, uh, these two authors, um, Matteo Pasquinelli and Vlad Androla, have produced this absolutely superb uh, um, uh, essay, uh, visual essay on this subject of AI as digital op optics. And they call this AI as the NOAA scope, an instrument to see and navigate the space of knowledge. Um, so, now I'll move on to discuss the, the theological significance of um, sharing the world with AI agents and other entities. Uh, so there are two aspects to this. First is uh, two major aspects of the pre-modern ontology which forcefully enter, uh, re-enter our consciousness. Uh, first is the idea of an immaterial realm. Uh, and second is the existence of extra human agencies and minds uh, with benevolent or malevolent intent. Together, these two areas show how enchantment has been continuous throughout the modern period. Uh, and Islam 
is often regarded as a disenchanted religion, uh, but it still includes belief in uh, other entities. I already mentioned jinns, but also angels. Um, and uh, as I say, um, in particular, the immaterial realm is, is a very a key part of Islamic belief. So here in what follows, I'll be discussing how AI is a significant intensification of uh, enchantment. First, with regards to the immaterial realm, uh, once again, we have a material realm described by science and an immaterial realm that operates as a different plane of the real. In Islam, this is known as al ghaib and is referred to specifically, it's even in the very first chapter of the Qur'an, uh, the very beginning of the, the major chapter of the Qur'an, uh, Al-Baqarah, the, the ghaib is mentioned, the unseen realm. Um, so now it's a new immaterial world that's effectively being brought to our, uh, created by the existence of digital platforms. And these digital platforms presently represent micro worlds uh, where AI is both embedded uh, as agents, assistants, and uh, other types of entities and agents, uh, but is also imminent to this plane of action and interaction. Uh, it's both agent and world, uh, and the distinction is uh, increasingly blurred. Uh, in the Islamic and pre-modern worldview, reality unfolds from the unseen, and so it is today uh, with the artificial worlds of AI. Uh, what counts as reality is what is regarded as data in the machine. Um, so the authors uh, of this visual essay discuss uh, the uh, vectorization, uh, the, the, world, the idea of world to vector. It's the vector representation of everything in the world uh, and in high, in high dimensional spaces. Uh, which is necessary for uh, prerequisite for AI uh, to learn from. So it's learning from data uh, captured from the world. As a consequence, uh, the artificial informational world alone is given uh, the status of, uh, of reality. And whatever cannot be represented digitally or in this, in the format uh, or the data structures that AI can learn from uh, is excluded from this new artificial form of existence. Um, the problem is this world is more inscrutable than the religious unseen. Um, and from this unseen background, AI systems come to signify the eye of providence. So legal scholar Orla Linsky is to, in seeking to define and conceptualize the power platforms has described this as the power of providence, where providence is understood as the foreknowledge, protective care, divine direction, control or guidance of God. So AI appears to possess the power of providence in three respects. First, AI is used in platforms uh, as the all-seeing eye uh, that is omnipresent and aware, a symbolism we saw earlier in the NVIDIA logo. Uh, AI is also an influence that controls human lives. And third, AI and machine learning give the impression that it is not of human origin, i.e. human input in designing is masked as the systems acquire their own limited agency and automaticity. The point here is that AI signals a turn from machine being surrogate uh, to de facto master of the human universe. And that this is the argument of uh, um, two authors, Crombez, I'll provide the reference at the end. Uh, the prospect of artificial intelligence appropriates con concepts that have hitherto been reserved for the divine. So in the Islamic context, first of all, this stands in opposition to the central Islamic concept of Tawheed, uh, unity and oneness of God. Um, second, it purports to offer perfect, uh, the potent, the ambition to achieve perfect justice through AI systems is being entertained at present. But in Islam, God's justice is accompanied by mercy uh, and forgiveness and other attributes. Um, now, the second um, area of enchantment uh, or the pre-modern worldview which is coming into focus through AI technology is the existence of extra human agencies and minds with benevolent, with benevolent or malevolent intent. So AI, so in pre-modern worldviews, we had a world filled with spirits, meaning God, angel, demons, and so on. And these extra human agencies and minds represented loci of spiritual power with benevolent or malevolent intent. So according to Steph Alpers, who I understand will be speaking in the next session, um, he puts forward a minimal definition of animism which combines three features. First, attributing subjective characteristics to, to the material environment. Second, assumptions that 
objects actively and autonomously influence human life and finally accompanying feelings of fear and fascination and awe with respect to these objects and entities all of which permeate the present discourse on ai the second aspect of this type of re-enchantment uh, or enchantment intensification of enchantment is moral forces from relics that impinge on human beings uh, and i'll show how this comes about in the final section and third is an enchanted world which has causal powers which are capable of bringing us into its field of force and as I say, all of these aspects are part of uh, the modern technological environment that we encounter today. And all of these factors re-inject mysterious aspects into an individual's understanding of the world, thereby creating a sense of enchantment. The important point here is enchantment paves the way, I would argue, uh, for a secular re of the material world. First of all, interaction with digital systems and AI entities involves interaction with a hierarchy uh, where hierarchy represents a new sacred ordering and second i would say that the discussion on security and the future of digital security should also be seen as the sacralization of the realm of cyberspace uh, which as we've discussed has come to ex represent the world itself which is coextensive uh, with the physical world um, now uh, I will, since I think I'm running out of time, I will go over the um, topic of uh, Islamic prayer bots and digital afterlife industry. Um, but I would just point out that uh, this is again indicative of such reenchantment and is a revival uh, of a materialistic form of widespread religious teachings uh, and hence of significant theological interest. Um, finally, uh, this this area of um, AI and manipulation and control, as we interact with AI, uh, as I mentioned, we form part of its world as an informational representation of ourselves. Um, and it's interesting to note that the idea of um, puppetry, uh, going all the way back to uh, ancient Greece, um, the puppet was called the neuropastus, uh, um, from the word neuron, meaning sinew, ten tendon, or wire. Um, so such informational representations um, are how the system sees us. Um, for example, in advertising networks, advertising exchange networks, as we use new digital services, we should also realize that we're part of these new hierarchies and orderings of um, uh, computational nodes, um, where it's our informational representation uh, that is connected to to different types of um, machine learning system or predictive uh, system. Um, altogether, this places AI in the position of being uh, the controller of that informational representation um, and bringing our physical actions in conformity to what is predicted uh, or what can be predicted by the system, um, uh, which comes as controller of, of our, of our uh, physical lives. So um, I had a few more points to mention here, but um, I think since I'm running over time, I will end here um, with a summary um, and I'll uh, head over back to Boris. Thank you very much, Jakub. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you fine. Okay, great, great. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for this very, very interesting and rich um, uh, presentation. We now have about uh, 22 minutes for discussion and questions. So if you have questions, please uh, let us know via the chat so that we can uh, give the floor to you and I'll uh, keep track of the list. So... Um, you can either ask your question via chat or uh, just say, I have a question, and then uh, we'll, I'll tell you to switch on your mic when, you're, when, you, when it's your turn. So um, maybe I can, maybe I can uh, start with a question, Jakub. Um, um, which regards the, the, the idea of re-enchantment uh, or 
mean, you, you, you switch between saying enchantment and re-enchantment. Um, so when we talk about um, these kinds of phenomena, which can, I think, be very convincingly described uh, in the vocabulary, in religious vocabulary, in your case, you used uh, Islamic uh, 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 vocabulary to, to describe these things. Um, I am always wondering, um, well, yes, that is one approach to this, um, but it's certainly not the only one. So um, the question is, when, when you talk about re-enchantment, would you say that you are um, describing a major trend in, 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 in present-day societies, or at least in those which are... Uh, um, uh, which have access to these technologies or which are uh, uh, under the influence of these technologies? Or is this just one interpretive frame that you are offering? So that would be my question. Uh, yes, I think um, uh, analyzing uh, AI as a, um, in a religious context, I think enchantment is a very useful frame um, of, a, of understanding. Um, the type of discourse that surrounds artificial intelligence. Uh, I, you, you're absolutely right that uh, enchantment would be much more accurate than uh, re-enchantment. Uh, it's actually it's the idea that um, uh, that modernity has been disenchanted, which which has been pointed out by numerous authors that this is a mistaken understanding of modernity. And in fact, modernity uh, has always had different forms of enchantment, which have uh, persisted. Um, in different areas, uh, and I would say that uh, uh, the idea of artificial intelligence is uh, another uh, continuation of such forms of enchantment. But I would even go further that discourse around AI and cyberspace is um, uh, a significant intensification of enchantment of enchanted types of uh, understandings of of of, of, of um, of, 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 of the world, uh, but also um, uh, uh, serve as, um, uh, as, as replacing many religious conceptions um, through this type of um, AI and uh, transhumanist discourse um, uh, around these technologies. Um, so, uh, so yes, I find it very, a, a very useful um, uh, idea to uh, deploy when looking at AI from a religious perspective, um, because when it comes to Islamic tradition, um, Islam is making a claim about the ultimate nature of reality. Um, so, from an Islamic perspective, if all of those conceptualizations of reality have been vacated from a secular understanding, uh, then they, new ideas must come in to fill this vacuum. Um, so these ideas include um, uh, narratives about the origins of the universe, origin of human beings, um, the purpose of human, uh, human, hu human beings and human society, um, and then also its eschatology and uh, then uh, the um, uh, apocalyptic narratives which come into existential uh, uh, the, 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 the discourse on existential um, risk related to AI, for example. Um, so all of these, as I mentioned, rep um, reprise uh, areas of uh, theological or religious worldview. Um, so it's a full uh, cosmogony, um, uh, cosmology, uh, soteriology, um, uh, eschatology, and so on. Um, so, uh, so the point is that um, that our secular society still has uh, a religious imagination, uh, which needs to be understood, and um, is best related to um, the uh, pre-modern traditions, in my view. Thank you, Jakob. Um... We have a question from uh, Inken Paul. Inken, yes. please switch on your mic and your cam if you like. Yes, I tried, but I do not see myself. So, um, 
Am I ready to go? Yes, yes, we can also Great. see you. Great, so uh, very nice to meet you, Jakub. And, uh, hi. hi. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Hi. Um, you mentioned that um, in the Islamic tradition, knowledge is necessary for seeing or understanding or getting God. And um, I was under the impression so far that uh, as important as knowledge, um, are the are the senses because uh, in the Islamic world, as much as I know it, it's uh, the hearing of the recitation of the Quran and its calligraphy, which is important for getting God. So um, I was uh, wondering, um, and also as far as I'm familiar with it, um, it's uh, important for the understanding of God is a uh, is a sense of the aesthetics um, of the Quran and the recitation. Mm. So um, I'm wondering what you think about that in with regard to artificial intelligence, because if this would be true, then um, artificial intelligence and all these augmented realities give us much better possibilities to experience God. And uh, wouldn't that um, fit well into the Islamic tradition? Yes, uh, let me clarify. Uh, first of all, uh, in the Islamic tradition, um, the um, in Islamic epistemology, uh, the senses are uh, one of the key means of knowledge. So it's the the the, sen the senses, uh, empirical uh, observation of the world. Then it's um, the reason and uh, revelation. Uh, so all of these are crucial to um, our obtaining knowledge, um, a sound, verifiable knowledge of the uh, nature of reality. So ultimately, the revelation is, um, each verse of revelation is known as an ayah, a sign. Uh, and a sign is pointing towards, um, uh, well, uh, pointing towards uh, an aspect of ultimate reality. Uh, and God's one of God's names in the Quran discourse is um, al-Haq, uh, ultimate, which is literally the truth or the ultimate reality. Um, so it's through uh, this combination of a reason, revelation, and um, uh, sensory mediation through the senses uh, that we gradually go on a journey uh, towards knowledge of God. So the ultimate uh, objective uh, is uh, to obtain knowledge of God. Now, when you mentioned that wouldn't AI or um, uh, augmented reality or such technologies produce um, a deeper understanding of God. The problem here, as what I'm trying to discuss in this presentation, um, is that we don't actually know the world um, in the way with the signs that God has intended for us to see to point towards him. So there are two, Islam also has a discourse on uh, natural theology. Uh, so this, we, not only in the Revelation are the signs, but also in the world itself. Uh, now, when we, as I say, um, hollow out the natural world and recreate an artificial world, then our knowledge is limited to what is only within such artificial constructs. Uh, it's completely self. It's completely self-referential. Um, our knowledge can only doesn't it point out to anything out beyond itself, uh, beyond the artificial realm. Uh, it even ceases to point to nature as it truly is. Um, so this is why, um, as I met, the, why I bring the understanding of science in, into it, because um, new understandings about reality will produ be produced, which uh, ultimately don't point to anything beyond uh, the material world. Whereas when you approach the natural world and the, si and the signs of God in the natural world, uh, then these are signs which the human being living in the world is supposed to interpret as pointing beyond uh, the material and physical world, uh, ultimately pointing towards uh, God himself. Um, so this is what has been excluded. So already the world, uh, which is called uh, um, the dunya, um, is uh, illusory. Uh, it's already a veil that you're supposed to penetrate through, to pierce through, with uh, spiritual vision, spiritual 
by by the means of guidance and revelation and uh, spiritual practice uh, to pass through that veil um, to gain spiritual insight. Um, so when God says, for example, that certain people are blind, for example, He says that their their hearts is their hearts that are blind. Um, it's not that that the eyes have become blind to these realities. It's it's the the locus of 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 intellect, um, which which becomes blind to ultimate reality. So, with artificiality, the artificial construction of the world, um, proceeding from AI technologies, we are in a double fold veil from the nature of ultimate reality, which is a significant problem. Not only that, these technologies come to introduce their own resacralization or their own form of sacralization of these new spaces which they, which have been created. Um, so, uh, once again, uh, there's always um, uh, going to be um, a, a position of the, the, the Godhead or um, the, uh, uh, the, the notion of God. But once it's um, only seen through this artificial, these artificial constructs, then that God is produced from the machine itself. So this is why the machine itself becomes um, uh, idolized. Um, there's another point as well. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's very significant, I think, uh, that digital assistance um, and the idea of uh, the idea of um, communic uh, uh, communicative interfaces with digital assistants, uh, communicating via speech acts with uh, with AI. Um, yeah, I think that's that's very significant significant as well because um, of the role of the um, the hearing in um, understanding. Um, so so there is a certain um, elevation of sight to the uh, to the to the to the pinnacle of the senses uh, whereas if you take the Quranic discourse the revelation has been provided through um, through, through uh, oral uh, transmission the, the 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 hearing of the Quran and recitation has primacy um, so uh, there's another aspect as well I didn't talk about the the idea of uh, manipulation control from AI here but when I talk about virtual reality, it's not necessary that we wear um, a virtual reality headset that occludes all of our senses. Um, if you look at, for example, Bluetooth headsets now, uh, they occlude their sense of hearing. Um, and they don't just provide, you know, you know, ability to hear uh, an augmented soundscape, but they also comprise numerous sensors. Um, which monitor, for example, your head position, your your temp, you, you know your temperature. Any all types of sensory apparatus can be integrated into such Bluetooth headsets, um, and again serve as a type of integration of the human being uh, with informational systems. Um, and then that informational environment, which people are uh, interfacing with, uh, can be. Uh, reconfigured uh, through AI at, and the, the, the supercomputer, um, so the, the supercomputers uh, networks which we're connected to, which we're effectively tethered to, um, on the other side of such such devices. Uh, so then, you know, our vision while we're looking at our devices and our hearing, and are both um, integrated into the system. It's only a matter of time. Uh, it's a great ambition for for companies to uh, produce um, augmented uh, uh, glasses, for example. Uh, whether or not such technology is viable is is still open to question. But um, there's certainly a strong ambition, and that that would be again a totalization of immersion in an in in such an information environment. But what I'm pointing out is, in many respects, we're already uh, that that digital layer already exists, and we're already um, in, in interacting with it, and speech is the latest modality, which is being um, and and the, the the hearing, which is the latest modality, which is being uh, integrated into the into the system. Thank you, Jakub. Um, I have so far no other question in the chat. Would anyone like to ask a question?
Okay, uh, Margarita, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yeah, hey, you well. Uh, hello, Jakob, uh, it's good hello. to see you again. And uh, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a small question on, um, on Islamic prayer bots, um, to which you only referred uh, briefly in your presentation. Um, so how do you link them with enchantment and how do they bring about, uh, contribute to enchantment? Well, the key issue of enchantment there is, um, is actually, I would say, um, the, the idea of a digital afterlife industry. So it's not actually prayer bots, which I would, um, which I would say is, uh, especially in Islam, in Islamic context. And I'm, I'm not sure, uh, how far one can say that that's driving uh, a type of Islamic enchantment or anything like that, but it does have a significant, um, uh, role in uh, understanding the nature of um, of uh, the moral moral agency in uh, in cyberspace. So, for example, um, within the philosophy of information, which is which Floridi talks about, is the idea of artificial evil as well as artificial artificial good. Um, so, AI is capable of um, of, of good and evil, basically. Uh, so if we accept, for example, that prayer bots um, are actually affecting uh, something uh, significant when they issue a prayer in cyberspace, um, then are we also saying that this is a contribution of artificial good? And if, if that's conceded, then also um, you concede artificial evil as well. Um, so it's really a question of, of the moral agency of these artifacts and the accountability that they have. Uh, that that's where um, uh, prayer bots is significant as a as a theological issue, um, because yeah, in the Islamic context, it's really only human beings which have um, uh, moral accountability and responsibility. Thank you. That was very clear. Yeah, uh, but I I would add elsewhere though. Um, generally speaking, the existence of um, of uh, of different types of entities, uh, prayer bots is one example. Uh, generally, they do um, uh, affect a, uh, an enchantment within within, within cyber within our interaction of digital systems. Um, so uh, I think that yeah, there could certainly be more study about its impacts on Islamic uh, understanding. Thank you very much, Jakub. We have time for one more question, maybe. Um, and I would then, well, if can, maybe I can ask one more question, Jakub. Um, you, you talked about you talked about um, extra human agents and uh, good and evil and um, uh, these kinds of things. Now, when we talk, I mean, maybe I'm completely wrong, but to my knowledge, at least, um, uh, so far, I mean, today, there are no artificial intelligence systems which set their own goals. So there is no, um, it's, it's, it's humans that set the goals of uh, artificial intelligence systems. So, so why should one not just say, I mean, I'm trying to, try to, to bring a provocative uh, response to what you just said now. Um, why should one not just say, well, yeah, um, uh, if people tend to experience these kinds of things as enchantments, and if people tend to experience these kinds of things as a new um, enchantment of their environments, then they are just wrong. I mean, they, they just misinterpret what they are seeing or feeling or experiencing. I'm trying to, to, to be the, uh, I'm trying to bring up a, a counter thesis here, uh, in the sense that um, why not? Uh, because there are no at the moment, there are no um, um, extra human agents. There are non-human agents, definitely, but these are basically uh, uh, agents which uh, are not intentionally evil or intentionally good or anything like that. So, so what's your take on that? Uh, well, the point for Floridi is that um, because the uh, the production of these types of agents is so complex and there's so many different people involved in the in the production of them it's not possible to just 
point to one individual um, who's who has a, the accountability. So it it needs to be uh, you need to give a, a scribe agency to uh, to the um, uh, to the agents themselves. Uh, so I think from from an Islamic ethical perspective, I would say that's um, uh, it, it's not really suitable for for human beings to relinquish their responsibilities and 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 uh, you know accountability in that way just because they've made the system so complex that they can't uh, that they you know um, give up such. Uh, um, uh, you know, they, they they cease to be accountable because they've only, you know, contributed to a fragment of the work. They should they should realize the ultimate goals that they're serving. Um, so that's as I say, uh, that mystification of the goals that the people themselves are serving in the production of these artifacts is, is I would say, a type of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, yeah, a type of uh, um, aspect of. Uh, of a uh, you know new new sacred ordering of society i guess um so um i think that was there a second part to your question no 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 that's 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 fine as an answer thank you very, thank you very much um so there are no more questions in the in the chat uh i would say that we can uh come to an end of this uh, first episode of our webinar series. So thank you very much uh, to our speaker, Jakub Chaudhry, um, for this very rich and uh, interesting presentation. Um, thank you very much, of course, to uh, all who have attended, all who have contributed to the discussion. Thank you very much to Paolo Traverso and Professor Ventura. Um, let me just uh, remind you that the next episode will take place on September the 30th uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, Central European, European Summer Time. Uh, and that will be just one hour, so 60 minutes. Today was a kind of an exception um, because we had the, uh, the, uh, the welcome and the introduction and so on. The next uh, episode, at the next episode, we will have Beth Singler from the University of Cambridge and she will talk about, uh, her talk was entitled B Blessed by the Algorithm, Religious Conceptions of AI and Their Impact on Society. So um, once again, thank you very much from our side. And uh, I hope we will, be, uh, we will uh, welcome you again at uh, at least some of the following episodes of our webinar series, Artificial Intelligence and Religion. Uh, yes, I, I would also just like to thank the organizers as well for this uh, uh, superb organization and being able to um, host the event uh, online when we were supposed to have it in, in person. But it's really, I think it's worked out terrifically. And thanks, thanks so much, Boris, and everyone for all of your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll keep in touch. And uh, thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.